اللهم صل على محمد وعلى I begin with the greetings of peace. Words that have been spoken in different languages but mean the same thing. I speak them first in Arabic. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May the peace of the divine, the almighty be with each and every one of us. Allahumma ameen. I always begin with the praise of Allah, thanking him, asking for his support and his assistance. I send the choicest blessings and prayers upon a Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. At first, when I was invited to take part in this memorial lecture, introductory, inaugural one on behalf of the blessed life of a doctor, Al-Hajj, Ali Muhammad Abdul Hamid, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brighten his grave and open to him an access to Jannah, Allahumma Ameen. When I was asked to speak, I wondered, you know, what kind of topic would be given because it's actually a somber mood. The topic that was chosen was about happiness. And, you know, many of us, alhamdulillah, thank you to the MC, we had moments of levity and moments of, of, of joy and, and smile. And I honestly do believe that uh, Dr. Al-Hajj, rahmatullahi alayhi Ali, wouldn't want us to sit in a depressed state. He would want us to rejoice and live in the way that he lived. And you could see it in all of the smiles that he exchanged with others and in all of the joy he brought to others. And therefore, in the time that I wish to spend with you today, there's two moments that I'll speak to you, a, a short period now, and we'll continue after a short break and tea and so on. And I want it to be something where it's not somber and it's not just something where we're just listening to uh, uh, things of, uh, that, that disconnect us from the overall themes of what our lifestyle is. There's a moment of happiness and there's a moment of sorrow and one is not appreciated without the other. And today when I begin, I want to uh, you know, go through a short PowerPoint that I prepared about the virtue and the fountain of virtue that we seek. See, happiness is about feeling good and doing good. And the goodness that you feel is always linked with the goodness you make other people experience. And each and every one of us at one point or another, we've exchanged that smile with someone and it could be that that smile was the reason that changed their day. And for that reason, we experience because of it happiness on our own account. And I want to lay bare for our visitors and, 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 and guests today, Muslim and non, an authentic establishment of what we as Muslims believe. See, Islam is really a, a built on universal values that we can all appreciate and interchange. And I want it to be something that is honest. I want to quote to you things that happened to, uh, to my prophet, our prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I want you to see how we dealt with different things and what were some of the, the texts of the Quran that came at very trying moments in our history uh, as Muslims. Kuala Lumpur is a unique city. You know, it's, uh, I kind of think of it as my second home. Uh, not just because of the my second home scheme. <laughs> you know, in the 1800s, the name of this city is actually quite unique. It's very representative of what I see in front of me today. Uh, the Klang River and the Gombak River, they come together, right? And they carry muddy silt different shades and different colors from different places, from different mountains. And they converge in a confluence in one particular place, Kuala Lumpur, right? And the people who came and initially set up the tin camps looking for things here, they said this is a place where these muddy rivers come together and they come into one place. And what I see in front of me, now you're not muddy or anything, <laughs> but you are the shades of this region. Kuala Lumpur is representative not just of that geologic process, but also of the cultural ethnic process. You have here a harmony and a stability that is very unique to any other place, very difficult to find any other place around the world. You find Muslims and non-Muslims, you find Chinese and Arab and Yemeni and you find people who've come from Indian backgrounds and from Tamil backgrounds who have all come together and meshed together 
to build a society and to build a place that seeks not just to empower them, but to be a reflection of what is good for the rest of the world to see. So I begin my discussion with asking myself and you, is happiness achievable? Is happiness achievable? Can you work towards it? Is it something you can make for yourself? Or is it something that you need to wait for other people to pass on to you? And many times, many of us, we are hostage to lack of happiness because we await it from being received from others. And really one of the greatest premise and one of the things that I want to highlight today is that there's this consciousness that must build within us that I am in charge and in need of establishing my happiness, of taking ownership of the sorrow and the pain and taking ownership of the joy and the happiness that I seek. There's this beautiful verse in the Quran and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Man amila salihan min dhakarin aw untha. You know, usually in the Quran, there's a, a male tense to it. God usually speaks as if it's speaking to men and it'll be passed on to women, except where it's important to show that this is something everyone should know. And he says, Man amila salihan, the one who works virtuous deeds, the one who does righteousness, min dhakarin aw untha. Be they male or female. وَهُوَ مُؤْمِنٌ And they have a sense of belief. They have a sense of conviction and faith in something greater than them. They believe that there is a power beyond them. They believe that there is a purpose that they have been sent here for. فَلَنُحْيَنَّهُ حَيَاةً طَيِّبًا For that individual, male or female, we will bless them with the good life. Hayatan tayyiba, the good life. And when they return to us, we will give them their fitting reward. Better than they had done in the life that they lived in compensation of the good that they had done to others. And therefore, from a theologic perspective for us as Muslims, the good life is possible. And the Prophet of Islam, he said, dunya hulwatun khadra. The worldly life you live in, it's full of greenery and enjoyment. It's meant for you to enjoy it and to take from it the good that you find in it and to enjoy your time that you spend on it. We also need to look at it from a non-theological perspective. And I want to speak of it as a mental state. You know, happiness is a state of mind. Happiness is a mental state of well-being that is characterized by a positive or a pleasant emotion ranging from contentment that can increase to intense joy. And therefore, it's something that is felt inside, not necessarily outside. Each and every human being instinctively, psychologists tell us, seek to pursue happiness. If I was to ask you honestly, you know, what do you want? I want, you know, it could be, I want a job. Someone isn't, doesn't have a job. Why do you want the job? Well, I want to earn a good income. Why do you want that? Well, I want to take care of my family. Why do you want that? Because I want them and I to be happy. At the end of the day, I want to get married. Some, some of us who are married, they say, you don't know the answer. <laughs> you know, you got to back up a little bit. <laughs> May Allah protect us and, and give our happiness in our homes. I want to get married. Why do you want to get married? Well, I want to be loved and I want, to sh- I want someone to love and love them back. And I want to build it. Why? 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 At the end of it, I want to be happy. And therefore... It's an instinct that every human being pursues. No one pursues, no one has a natural instinct to pursue sorrow. The first deterrent you have is to limit your sorrow, to limit your suffering, to limit the difficulties that you and I would experience in life. And therefore you seek a way away from sorrow by seeking an instinctive process 
to lead us to happiness. Now, there's some statistics, and, you know, it's taken from a, an influential book. It's called The Psychology of Happiness, and I did just want to quote the three points. If you can put them on the screen, inshallah. The first of them is that psychologists tell us that 50% of happiness is genetic. That's, you know, that's quite shocking. Like you're born already with 50% of the happiness that you're going to enjoy in life. You have a preset threshold in your psyche of how much happiness that you're going to enjoy in life. It's preset in you. It's genetically a byproduct. In fact, some, you know, some, it might not affect as many Malays living in Malaysia born here. But if you were born in the winter months in Canada, Yeah, <laughs> where it's dark and gloomy. If you were born in the winter months in northern climates, really southern climates, just by you being born in those months, you have a greater genetic propensity to suffering depression than those who were born in summer months. It's quite amazing. 50% of your joy, your sense of happiness, that instinctive pursuit of happiness, is a predetermined genetic set point for you. The second thing that we discover is that 10% of our happiness is due to the circumstances we find ourselves in. There are people, you know, we've all seen those uh, soapy Facebook, uh, you know, posts where you see that young child, he might not have full clothes or but you th they, they give them a ball or they give them a little bit of food, less than what you would have in an hour, they have it for a week. And you see the smile on their face. I've visited people, I've visited orphanages, I've visited slums in South Africa, I've visited the slums in Mumbai, I've visited the slums in Egypt. And I can tell you I've met people there who had greater happiness and appreciation of what they had than people who lived in Perth, in Canada, in Malaysia, that they had an unshakable happiness that transcended the circumstances they were in. The circumstances you were in, whether affluence or poverty, only makes up, from a psychology perspective, 10% of the happiness that you enjoy, which leaves a final 40%. And that 40, remaining 40%, is an individual's happiness as is derived from their intentional activities. We talk about niyyah, you know, in Muslims, there's a, a statement of the Prophet. One of the first things you'll be taught is إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَّاتِ Actions are judged and based on the intentions you have. And sometimes Muslims, we don't understand this hadith. We think it actually, you know, refers just to rituals of worship. When you come to pray, niyyah for salah. No, niyyah is the driving factor in every decision you make in life. It is related to every aspect of your life. What's your niyyah as a student? What's your niyyah as a medical professional, as a plumber? What's your niyyah as a taxi driver? You know, Martin Luther King, he said, if your share in life is to be a street sweeper, make your intention to be the best street sweeper in America. Wow. What's your niya? What do you want? What do you, what do you seek to do? Because the moment you commit yourself to something, you feel good about it, and it doesn't matter what it is. The moment you choose, I chose to do this. I'm going to commit to it. And it might not be what other people want to commit to, but this is my share in life. This is the circumstance I have. I'm not going to let that 10% overrule everything about me. Intention is really, really important. You know, I'm a teacher, and I, I say to my students, your marks, your year-end results, your career in life, your marriage, your divorce, how you raise your children is based on that one word, niya, intention. It's all about intention. What's your intent as a husband? What's your intent as a wife? What's your intent as a father? Is your intent just to be, I'm a biological father? You know, I gave the kids, I, I, I got that they're here. Okay, now go play over there somewhere. What's your intent? Are you an active participant in their life? 
Do you share with them a future that you seek to plot and plan and move them forward with? That's what gives you joy. That's what leads you to happiness. So 50% is a set point that's genetic, 10% is circumstantial to what you were born into, and 40% is based on the intention in the activities that you are involved in, in every aspect and in every day in your life. Whether those actions are discreet and personal to you, or they are open in public to others. So today, inshallah, for the next 25 minutes, I, want, I wish to initially speak about eroding happiness. What are the things that eat away at our happiness? Have you ever woken up in the morning and you felt happy and by the end of the day, <laughs> maybe not even the end of the day, by coffee, you're like before you finish your cup of coffee, your happiness was gone. I felt good. How are you feeling? Alhamdulillah. And it's not alhamdulillah, like alhamdulillah is like alhamdulillah, everything could be better. What are the things that erode happiness? The first of them is that we confuse success with happiness. All of us want to be successful. And we assume that if I'm successful in whatever it is I want to be successful, it doesn't really matter what that success is. It, doesn't, it could be in my education, it could be in uh, you know, my business. We confuse, we think that if I get that thing and am successful in this, I definitely will be happy. And of course, each and every one of us here will nod our head and we say, well, you know what? I actually really, really wanted this. I got successful in it. I'm still not happy. Success is metric. It's measurable. What, what do I mean by metric? If I want to know how financially successful you are, I wouldn't ask, but I can ask how much do you have in the bank? What kind of car do you drive? Uh, are you from Damansara, Bangsa? Where, where do you live, right? Uh, you know, what, what's your area code? Are, do you drive yourself or are you driven, right? Signs of apparent financial affluence and success. If I want to know how successful you are in your education, uh, where did you do your degree? Not just what is your degree. What did you study? How far did you go? Where did you study? Were you on a scholarship because you had high rankings or did your daddy pay for you? and you got the degree by money. What's your success? It's metric, it's measurable, it's linear. Happiness is not. I can't look at a person who is successful and assume that they're happy. Uh, in Australia, there was a doctor, husband and wife, both of the medical doctors in Adelaide. This is this year with all apparent signs, everything they put on, on, you know, everything you put on Facebook, you know, when you see someone's Instagram, you're like, man, these people are happy. <laughs> Did they just eat cod? <laughs> it's like, how do you get cod? Tasman salmon. Whoa, caviar for breakfast? It's like, mush, you see? They have, you know, you look at someone's Instagram and you think their life is perfect. Facebook is now one of the key research interests of psychologists. They actually tell you a lot of the things people put about themselves, you can almost assume it's the opposite. The guy who looks like he's the greatest father in the world is usually the guy who just takes the photo and then says, okay, kids, go over there and play. She's the one, oh, I love my husband, and it, he comes home, he doesn't talk to her, she doesn't talk to him. They might even have different bedrooms. These two medical doctors had a life that looked to all their friends, to all their neighbors, that they were absolutely in love with each other, absolutely happy, that their three children were blessed beyond anyone's expectation. And yet they committed, you know, may Allah protect us. They took their own lives, the lives of their children, because they were suffering severe depression. There's no one in this room who did not watch a Robin Williams movie. 
he was the happiest guy on TV. He's Mrs. Doubtfire, man. He's the guy who, there, there was no way you could look at Robin Williams and assume that he was struggling with unhappiness from a genetic perspective. That he, could, he you know, in his note, he said, I brought joy to everyone but myself. He had the success. He could walk into any place and buy whatever he wanted. He was recognized anywhere in the world. There was no one who would ever hear a request from him and deny it. But yet internally, that metric success did not translate into latent feelings of internal happiness. So one of the first things, one of the first mistakes that we make is that we assume because of success, I will find happiness. It erodes our happiness. Because the moment you achieve what you want, I'm not telling you don't be successful. In fact, you want to be successful. I'm not saying actually, you know what, give up your job, you'll be happy. No. But don't look for your happiness just in your job, just in your career, just in your children, just in your husband, just in that wife, just in the diamond ring. Although it does bring my wife happiness. <laughs> or it brings me happiness to give it, so someone's going to get happy. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Number two, in the things that erode our happiness, is pleasing others before ourselves. You know, there's this misunderstood statement of the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, where he says, لا يؤمن أحدكم حتى يحب لأخيه ما يحبه لنفسه. You cannot complete faith until you love for others what you love for yourself. All of us know this hadith. It's something that Jesus said. Even Buddha, you can find statements like that, where you will find happiness for other, in, in finding it for others, in wishing for others the good that you want for yourself. But here's the thing that many Muslims forget. The Prophet actually says, يُحِبُّهُ لِنَفْسِي The things you love for your self. What do I love? How do I know what, you should, what I want for you unless I can appreciate what I have? What are the things that make me happy? That I want you, yes, I want, I want you to be happy. But I got to know what that feeling is first to be able to pass it on to you. And there's this statement, Someone who does not possess something cannot pass it on to others. If I don't have it, how can I share it? If I don't appreciate something, how can it translate into me wanting for you unless I have found that joy within myself first? And therefore, we erode from our happiness when we're looking to please everyone. How can I do this for you? How can I do that? And then at the end of the day, I'm the very last person who no one has thought about me. And I have set a precedent of not thinking of myself so other people assume I'm already happy. I don't need anything. Because who, who does that for others and has forgotten themselves? One of the root causes of disunity and disharmony in our home life, in our family, you know, husband and wife, is this. Where there's an expectation, you know, I want to make her happy. I want to make him happy. But sometimes I'm going to do something at the expense of my happiness. And that's not right. That's not what is called for. And that will erode your happiness. Number three. When something isn't right, our circumstances aren't right, that the first point of blame is someone other than ourself. You look and you say, there's a problem, but it's not me. You know, it's, it, it can't be me. I'm, not, I'm never the problem. It's got to be her or him. It's them. It's my boss. The boss is always... Actually, I agree with that sometimes. <laughs> I, it's that person. It's outside my influence. I'm not the one who caused this to happen. And Islam actually, you know, comes with a very important story. The story of Adam and Iblis, the shaitan, is very, very much about this issue. Why is Adam forgiven and the devil not forgiven? When the devil 
did not prostrate and did not give servitude and did not give himself over to the order of God when he was told to prostrate to Adam. He was expelled from God's mercy and he had a chance to ask for mercy. Why doesn't he say, oh Allah, forgive me? Because when Allah asks him, why lima lam tasjud? Why did you not make sujood? Qala ana khayrun min. I have a right. I'm better than him. And he could be right. What do you, you know, if I come home with mud on my shoe, my wife says, stand at the door. Don't come in. But every one of us wants to have a fireplace in our home. You know, fire is something honorable compared to mud, right? Mud is something, stay outside, keep your boots outside. He might have a right in saying, I'm better. I'm, I'm from something that's more valuable. But that wasn't the issue. The issue was, did you follow what I ordered? And then when he's pressed, why didn't you do what I asked of you, O Iblis? He says, فَبِمَا أَغْوَيْتَنِي Because you allowed me to be misled. It's your fault, God. Why didn't you make me a follower of the truth? You should have just made me choose the right thing to do. It's your fault, not my fault. بِمَا أَغْوَيْتَنِي you, you allowed me to be misguided. Change that to now a few eras later, Adam. He's tricked, he eats from the tree, and Allah tells us in the Quran that the devil inspired in Adam and his wife to eat from the, the forbidden tree. After they eat, Allah says, why did you do it? The first thing Adam says, قَالَ رَبَّنَا He and his wife, they say, our Lord, ظَلَمْنَا أَنفُسَنَا We wronged ourselves. It's not Iblis's fault, even though Allah said he did it. Iblis whispered to them. They didn't blame Iblis, who is convenient to blame, who even Allah said, don't listen to Iblis, but he listened. They don't even mention Iblis. We wronged ourselves. If you don't forgive us, and show us your mercy, we will definitely be from those who are forever losers. That's a human perspective. That is a correct perspective. And the moment you're able to see within yourself the capacity, the ability to take blame, to stand up and say, it's my fault. I erred. I did wrong. I should have done right. The moment that you are able to put on yourself what was a negligence from your perspective, the easier it is for you to find joy at the final outcome of solving that problem. Number four, we try to control everything. Um, some people call it a God complex. Um, at times you will find as well medical doctors, they're very, you know, I'm in control of everything in the, in the ER room. I'm in control in the, in, in, in the surgery. And, you know, when you find it outside, when, when your job entails that you, you need to be in control, when it comes into your personal life, sometimes it's very difficult to say, I'm not in control. And I don't want to be always in control. And I don't need to be in control. Maybe this person could be in control. The Prophet wasallam, he wasn't one who consolidated power just for himself. You know, in, in, in numerous perspectives, a person would come and ask a question. Someone would come and say, I had this dream. What do you think it means, O Prophet of Allah? Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu would say, Ya Rasulullah, can I try? Can I, can I interpret? The Prophet said, go ahead. Give it a go. Bismillah. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he, he wasn't a person. No, no, Abu Bakr, I'm the messenger of Allah. How dare you? Right? The Prophet would come and he would say to the Sahaba, read for me the Qur'an. And they would say, read for you the Qur'an? It came down to you. <laughs> I want to hear it from you. No, no, I like to hear it from other than myself, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. He never dressed in, in, in regal clothing that marked him as being different to others. He never sat on a chair that only he could sit on. He never ate food that was exclusive just to him that no one else could have. He never allowed anyone to bend over for him, to honor him with a bow. That's all just service to God. And the moment we understand that there are things in life that are beyond us, that are not in our control, the happier we become. And therefore, there's this central concept for us as Muslims, and it's about fate, qadr. You know, we believe in fate. We believe that 
good things happen to bad people. And inversely, bad things, or what we think are bad, happen to good people. Uh, I was teaching yesterday, and part of what I was telling them, you know, uh, many of us, alhamdulillah, we've been blessed with a spouse, you know, a husband or wife, alhamdulillah. And for many of us, it took a long time to kind of find out who, you know, it's difficult to search for the right person. I'm sure there's a lot of people in the room still hunting. They got a sniper gun, right? Who's that? Who's that over there? Scope and everything. Tranquilize them before they get away. Right? They're on the look. They're, they're hunting. Could you imagine if you had to choose your parents? Like, look how difficult it is to choose your wife. Do you imagine if you had to choose your mom or your father or your brothers or your sisters? Could you imagine if you had to choose which country you would be born in? Whether you were born in an affluent or, or non-family. What color of skin you would have. What ethnicity you belong to. What era you would be born in. Could you imagine if those critical decisions that make you who you are right now were left for you to decide if your fate was yours that you had to choose? How difficult would your life be? And therefore Allah has made things very easy. Would any of you ever be able to choose the day that your loved one would depart? Oh yes, uh, I think on this day you can go. La wallah. There might be times where you don't like them very much. Say, okay, maybe tomorrow, brother. <laughs> right? Qadr is not for you. There is a power beyond your power. And it doesn't matter how much authority you have, how in control you are and all these other things, you don't have ultimate power. And that's a divine mercy from Allah. And the moment you understand that, the moment you can reconcile that there are things beyond me that I can't control, there are things that are within me that I can't stop this illness, I can't stop my aging, I can't stop this trouble, the moment you can reconcile that, the, it, it, it allows you to find joy and happiness in a way that you could not experience it if you lack that faith. Number five, hasad, envy, comparing ourselves to others. You know, uh, you can, uh, trying to keep up with the Patels. Mr. and Mrs. Patel, they bought a, a smart TV. One that spies on them, <laughs> right? We, we need a TV. Why? Because they got a TV. Our car, we need to upgrade. Why? Because Aisha, her husband got her one. Everything is compared to what other people have. And I assume my happiness is in tantamount linked to them. And that hasad does not harm them any less or more than it actually inflicts injury upon me. Because the things that you should enjoy, you lose their joy. The happiness you should find in what you've been given is limited because you're always looking over your shoulder. You're always looking ahead of you. You're always looking above you. And the Prophet said, don't always look above, but look to those beneath you so that you can appreciate what you've been given by the Almighty. Number six is self-limiting belief. I can't do it. You know, um, I was reading research. In grade seven, year seven, you know, your children 12 years old, that's one of the most critical years for their education. Why is that year so important? It's at that moment your children, they kind of switch into a formative uh, ideal and personality. The moment your child in year seven enters into a classroom, it didn't matter what their ranks were in year six, year five, year four, when they were younger in primary school. If they think about themselves, this is too hard, I can't do it, the rest of their educative process will be destroyed. They need a teacher who not only speaks to them about how smart they are, but about how hardworking they are. The moment your child in that age thinks it's about how smart they are, oh, I'm not smart enough to do it. They will never attain the top grades. But the moment is, wow, look how hard working you've been. Look at the result you've achieved. 
And therefore, one of the things that we always must have as an internal dialogue within us is that I can do it. I can do it. In overwhelming odds, I can do it. I'm going to push myself. I'm going to try again. That tenacity, that not, I will not give up spirit, has always been at the forefront of all success. And the Prophet وسلم, he would say, Ajaban li amril mu'min. How wondrous is the condition of a believer. Whether they receive good or hardship, they are always thankful and appreciative to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If they are given something good, they're happy and thankful. If they're giving something difficult, they're still thankful. They know that they just have to work harder and move further and that eventually everything will be okay. Number seven, causing our past to haunt us. You can't forgive yourself. You made a mistake, but you can't forgive yourself. Others have done injustice to you, you can't forgive them. You're letting them control the power of your future success because you're living with their perspective. And the, ha the haunting of your past limits the joy and the happiness that you find in the present and into the future. The Prophet ﷺ, he would say that a strong believer, you know, strong as in financial, economic, intellectual, physical, someone who's endowed with a purpose and a strength, strong in their faith in God, is more beloved to Allah than a weak believer, one who's weaker in those capacities. Although there's good in all of them, and then the Prophet says, desire that which will bring you benefit. Always seek the thing that will add value. And seek help from your Lord Allah. And do not give way to incapacity. Don't just sit and say, I'm going to wait for something to happen, something to change. Always be from those who moves forward. And then he says, if something happens to you, meaning in your past, don't say, if I had only done such and such, لو أني فعلت ذلك أو ذلك. Don't ever be from those who say, if I had done this, if I had taken that career, if I had chosen that job, if I had married that person, if I had moved, if I had sold earlier, if I hadn't held those stocks, if, 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 the moment you get into that cycle of saying, if such and such had not happened, rather say, Qaddar Allahu wa ma Sometimes there is a qadr that has influenced my decision. I, I didn't know enough. I made a mistake. Yes, it's my fault. But there is qadr in these matters as well. There's no blame that should continue. It, you had a loss. It ended. You have a future to succeed. Number eight and second to last before our break from the things that erode our success is that we have a philosophy of excess. Just the desire for more. You know, uh, there's poetry in Arabic that says, At times your inner soul hates to have loss or to feel any poverty or deprivation. But at times, to be deprived from one thing or another is an enrichment of your soul. The wealth of your soul is to know when enough is enough. فَإِنْ أَبَتْ If your mind, if your heart, if your consciousness, if your soul does not ever come to a point and say, I've had, this is enough, then the wealth of the world will never suffice it. The Prophet in another hadith, he says, If a human being was given two valleys full of gold, they'd look for the third. It's like, hey, what's over that hill? Maybe there's, you know, a little bit over there, right? And there's this beautiful statement of the Prophet ﷺ where he says, that true enrichment, true prosperity, true wealth 
does not come from possessing the material, but the enrichment is the enrichment of contentment of the soul. Uh, men, there's many people, and I've met people like this, uh, who would give up a lot of money to be able to sleep well at night. You know, Michael Jackson, and it's important, you know, these are people who are ayah, they're signs. You know, he, he had everything in the world, but the only way he could go to sleep at night, he had to take tremadol and, and narcotics. He couldn't find, you know, that rested spirit. It's difficult that you can just put your head down and, 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 and find sleep. Alhamdulillah, uh, you know, this is something, wallahi, I've been blessed with. You can ask the brothers who went to hajj with me. They were like, Sheikh Yahya, you took the record. We were in Muzdalifa. Those of you who've been to Muzdalifa, it's, you're, it's sand and it's concrete and it's noisy and it's people jumping over you. And I did, Allahu Akbar, did my salah, put my head down, and they're looking at me like, what is this man doing? And they were saying, are you asleep? And I'm like, no. <laughs> you keep waking me. Shh. I was out, alhamdulillah. Wallahi, doesn't matter where you are. Umar would say, la liya wa la alayhi. Oh Allah, I want to return to you. Not owing others and not being owed by others. Balance. I don't want to owe people anything. And I don't want anyone to owe me anything. I just, status quo, just to be happy. Finally, from the things that erode our happiness, is that we do good only because good is done to us. And that we don't do it regardless of the good done to us. If you only are going to treat people with good because they've done good to you, and if you're only going to share kind words with those who share kind words to you, if you're only going to smile at those who smile at you, if you're going to only put your hand out to those who you're sure are going to take it from you, if you're not going to bear yourself to criticism and accept the injustices of others, if you're going to sit in your home and just say, I don't want to meet with anyone unless they like me, you will never find quality of life. If you're going to be so thin-skinned that any rub tears you, that any contact you have with others destroys your mood just because someone gave you an insensitive look, unkind word, you will never find that inner joy, that measurable inner joy that only you can assess and measure within yourself. There's this famous incident in the life of the Prophet ﷺ where someone had wronged his wife Aisha radiallahu anha. Her father, when he heard that this man had said this, Abu Bakr said, this man said this? I've been giving charity to him for years. Wallahi, I won't give him any more charity. I'm going to let him suffer for him to act this way. So Allah revealed Quran. Let not those who've been blessed by Allah withhold the kindness they've done to others on account of their wrong. The greatest way to show someone who's wronged you is to rise above their wrong and to treat them with the dignity that you would always have wanted from them to treat you with. And that's not weakness, that's strength. Leadership is that the one who has wronged you, that you still carry them along with you to a place where they will change and model themselves into better behavior. And with that, I bring to a close my first session with you. I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes my words uh, an action for me to practice and to follow and to benefit from and that it had some insight into my life and your life. I pray that my words and the reminders and the mention of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the Quran is put in the balance and the scale of the dear Hajj, Dr. Ali. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy upon him and make this event a foundation of good for that which will come from it, that I'm assured will come from it. And I pray that uh, you enjoy the company of each and every one of us here today and that we network and get to know each other in the auspice of our Hajjah. Jazakumullah khair. And I look forward to continuing with the second part where I speak to you about nurturing happiness.
السلام عليكم ورحمة الله